Thank you, Filio, and good morning. Jill's already taken you through some of the spelling data that's presented in the Aspects of Writing report. Since that work was carried out, we've been carrying out further, more detailed analyses of the spelling data, and I'd like to share with you some of the preliminary findings from this work. Before I start presenting the findings, I'd like to consider some of the methods that can be used for analysing spellings. Brooke et al. in a 1993 study suggested that to investigate spellings, you can either use a form of spelling tests or you can use examples of students' work spellings taken from their own work. Several studies have investigated spellings through spelling tests. For example, Bibout in 1985 used a gap-filling exercise to generate lists of spelling errors, whilst Brooke and Waters, in their study, and Coleman et al. in 2009, used dictated spelling lists. These studies have allowed the researchers to carry out detailed analyses of students' spellings for particular words, and also to look at concepts such as phoneme-grapheme correspondence, that is, how well the letters that students write down for the words correspond to the sound of the word. However, they can't provide an insight into the type of spelling errors that students are likely to make in their own work. For this, you need to look at students' spelling errors in the context of their writing. And there have been several studies that have done so. Brooks et al. used an archive language monitoring task to look at spelling errors. And whilst Coleman and Al, in their study, asked students to complete a 30-minute essay writing task from which they gathered in the spelling errors. These types of studies have allowed the researchers to investigate the frequency of students' errors in their work. And they've also allowed them to estimate the degree to which their errors have inhibited meaning. Whilst these studies provide an insight into the errors that occur in natural writing, they cannot be used to state with certainty which words students can and cannot spell correctly. Our study followed the latter method. We looked at spelling in the context of 16-year-olds writing in examinations. We would expect students working under time pressure and without access to dictionaries or to spell checkers to make some spelling errors in their work. However, spelling was included in the marking criteria for this particular piece. So we'd expect them to pay attention to their spelling and to minimise errors where possible. For example, through going back and checking their work to see whether they've made errors, or alternatively, avoiding writing particular words that they're aware that they cannot spell. This type of study is very important as it allows us to it highlights the type of errors students are likely to make when they go on either to further education or into employment. Within our study, we've carried out three strands of analysis so far. Firstly, we've undertaken some statistical analysis, looking at whether there are any statistically significant differences either between the levels of achievement or between the two genders. Secondly, we've looked at the most commonly misspelt words that occur in students' writing. And finally, we've used a coding framework to begin to investigate the type of errors students are making in their spellings. I'd like to begin by looking in more detail at the graph Jill presented to you earlier, which shows the percentage of words that candidates were misspelling in their work. We wanted to see whether the differences that you can see between the different levels of achievement were statistically significant. And please note that in this section of the study, we've used grades as a proxy for level of achievement. At the moment, we've only looked at the 2014 data, which you can see in the solid green line with the triangles marking the individual grades. We investigated the significance of the differences using a negative binomial regression and we compared the number of errors made by students at each grade to those made by a G-grade student. We found that the differences for the grades were statistically significant, so we were able to use these to predict the numbers of errors that students with different levels of achievement were likely to make. And this is shown in this table. It shows the number of predicted errors students would make for every single word misspelt by a candidate at grade G. As as you can see, the lowest achieving students make 10 times more errors than the highest achieving students and 5 times more errors than the <coughs> middle level of achievement.
We've also looked at the difference between genders. Again, we investigated them using the 2014 data and found that female students appeared to make fewer errors than male students did. So again, we investigated the differences using a negative binomial regression. It showed that the difference between genders was statistically significant. So we were able to use the results of the analysis to predict the number of errors a female student would make for every single error made by a male student. And this is shown in this table. As you can see, for every five errors made by a male student, a female student would only be expected to have four errors. Finally, we investigated the proportion of sparing errors and whether they varied by gender at different levels of achievement, which is shown by the graph on your screen. You can see that the lower achieving males appeared to make more spelling errors and have a higher proportion of spelling errors than the female students, but the differences at the higher grades were smaller and less consistent. When we investigated the differences in the number of spelling errors, male and female students with the same level of achievement using a um, binomial regression, we found that the results were not statistically significant. So there were no statistical differences at either high, medium or low achievement levels. This does not contradict the overall findings, but merely suggests that the overall findings appear as a result of cumulative differences <coughs> across the achievement range. I'm now going to look at the second stage of the analysis, which investigated the commonly misspelt words. This particular analysis has looked at words from 2007 and 2014 as we have definitive lists of the misspelt words and these can be found in Appendix C of your report. We are currently working on identifying the spelling errors in the 100 word sample from 2004 and we'll be analysing the data from this shortly. The two word clouds you can see show the 150 words that were most commonly misspelt by students in 2007 and 2014. Each of the words have been misspelt by at least two students and the size of the word indicates the number of students who were misspelling them. You may notice there are several words that appear in both word clouds for both years, including off, myself, to and both forms of there. You may also notice that some of the words appear to be associated with particular tasks. In 2014, the path to nowhere task generated misspellings of words such as nowhere and forest whereas the task attempt describing cooking a meal generated misspellings of words such as ingredients and potatoes. In contrast, in 2007, the task produced many answers about appearing in TV talent shows or game shows, and therefore we find common misspellings of words such as crowd, nervous, game show and contestant. It is clearly impossible for students to avoid misspelling words associated with the context of the task, but we were interested to see whether that accounted for some of the differences we could see, so we investigated the cooking-related misspelt words from 2014. When we excluded those words from the analysis of the 2014 data, we found it made very little difference to the proportion of spelling errors that students were making. Even amongst the lowest achieving students where the greatest differences were found, it changed the proportion of spelling errors by less than half a percent. So that was not responsible for the change. For those of you who want to know which words were most commonly misspelled by students, this slide shows the top 16 misspellings for both of the two years, along with the number of students who misspelled each of these words. Just to be clear, for the purposes of this table, we did not count multiple instances of the same misspelling from the same student. Thus, the nine misspellings of minutes in 2014 are from nine different students. They are not due to the same student misspelling the word nine times. Notice also that in both <coughs> years, we have words which tie in terms of the number of times they were misspelt by students. For example, were, thought and crowd were each misspelt ten times in 2007. That is why we have a top 16 and not the more usual top 10 or top 15. By taking the top 16, we were neatly able to hit the intervals between the frequencies for both years. To make it easier to compare the lists, the words you can see that appear in the top 16 for both words are formatted in bold. 
Words that are not bold may still appear in the list for the other year, but they do not appear in the top 16. Students did not necessarily make the same mistakes when it came to misspelling oh. words. This slide shows you the top six most commonly misspelt words from 2014 and all the ways that students misspelt them. You'll notice that some of the words are misspelt in exactly the same way by all students, for example, off and to, whilst others have multiple ways of misspelling them. Where there are multiple ways, the most common error made by students is indicated by an asterisk. So you can see that the most common misspelling of myself is to insert a space, and this error was made by 17 of the 20 students misspelling this word. Some of the students are less consistent, so if you look at the spellings of thought, th missing out the final T to spell though was only done by four out of the 19 students misspelling that word. Misspellings of the words myself and two appeared across the entire range of achievement, although it's important to note the top achieving students' only error was to incorrectly insert that space, whereas only the lower achieving students misspelt the word said. Finally, we investigated the type of errors that students are making. We coded all the misspelt words using a framework developed on the version that Elliot and Johnson used in 2007 to classify the single sentence sample from 2004. Their framework consists of five broad categories, which you can see on the screen in front of you, each of which consisted of several subcategories. For example, sound-based errors included subcategories such as homophones and phonetically acceptable alternative spellings. Elliot and Johnson's framework is slightly different to that commonly used in the literature. Frameworks in the literature have tended to focus on whether the phoneme-grapheme combination, so that's whether the combination of letters making the word is acceptable for the sound, or they've looked at the proportion of errors involving omission, commission, and transposition and substitution of letters, e.g. the studies we saw earlier from Brooks et al. and a study from Cook in 1997. Our coding aimed to look at the types of error found in the word list from 2014 and 2007 in more detail. We used each of the five main categories and the subcategories. For each misspelt word, we identified all the individual errors that had been made within the word, and we categorised each one into a category and a subcategory. Individual errors were either words, errors were concerning just one letter, or where two letters have been reversed, or those that concerned a single phoneme, so a single sound. For example, you saw earlier that students had confused the two forms of their writing, T-H-E-R-E instead of T-H-I-R. We coded that as a single error because it occurred from them writing the wrong grapheme. They wrote E-R-E instead of E-I-R. In order to distinguish between errors which were sound-based and those that involved omission, commission and transposition of letters, we used the Oxford English Dictionary Online to identify the phoneme that the student had misspelt. We then used charts of phoneme grapheme correspondence that were published by the Department for Education to see whether the spelling the student had written was phonetically acceptable or not. We also looked at graphemes that were not acceptable according to the chart, but where we felt students' accent might have led to that particular spelling, and we gave them their own particular subcategory. So the two pie charts show you the results of our analyses. They only show you the five broader spelling error categories, as we are still in the process of coding the detailed subcategories, and we hope to publish this research in due course together with the 2004 codings as well. The pie charts show you there are similar proportions of all the error types in both years. Sound-based errors were the most commonly single source of single error in both years, and rule-based errors, so things like forgetting to drop the E when you added ING, were the least common category and contributed only 13% of spelling errors in both years. There was a slight proportion in the number of words that had multiple spelling errors in 2014, and these were only included in this particular category. So a 19% of all words in 2007 had increased to 23% in 2014. 
Similarly, there was a decrease in the proportion of spelling errors due to writing, such as where students incorrectly inserted a space or missed off the end of a word. And this dropped from 20% in 2007 to just 17% of all words in 2014. So that concludes the spelling findings so far. As I mentioned, we are in the process of coding the subcategories and we are also investigating the 2004 spellings. And we hope to, invest, to publish this research in due course. Thank you very much.